moving on to MRI, I don't want to bog you down with too much physics or the details about MRI. I think it's uh, the basic would be to uh, understand we have different sequences, mainly T1 weighted sequences and T2 weighted sequences. Those are kind of like the bread and butter. And you can think the, the first one you have here is a T1. Uh, you can th think of that one as a more anatomic one. It's I guess more closely related to the CT and then the T2 or the fluid sensitive sensitive images those uh, will show you edema and as the name implies fluid. Uh, here you, the bone marrow is a normal uh, has a increased signal intensity because fat is bright on, on this sequence and uh, that's how it, it would look on a normal T1 sequence. Uh, on the T2 you're uh, tailoring for uh, edema or evaluation of, of other uh, other types of pathology, and this is the normal appearance on T2. Like I said, the advantages are soft tissue, I shouldn't say soft tissue resolution, but more uh, soft tissue characterization, and you have flexible imaging pl uh, planes. That is true, we can do reconstructions on CT, but really acquisition on CT is limited by the gantry, while on MRI you can really change your acquisition in many different ways. So your acquisition can actually, uh, the parameters can change and then you can also uh, perform reconstructions. So what are the indications for MRI? Some general indications would be neurologic deficit, uh, cord disease, acute trauma, if you're concerned for cord or ligamentous injury, cancer, uh, spinal canal stenosis from degenerative disease, infection, and prior uh, spinal surgery, which uh, would encompass a lot of indications, including um, epidural abscesses or epidural hematomas. We have an example here, a series of, of uh, cases uh, on the left, you have a syrinx when you have increased signal uh, in the cord. Here you have a dermoid, and um, on the right you have an epidermoid, uh, sorry, an uh, ependymoma, which uh, it, it's a common tumor in the spinal canal. On the far right you have, uh, this is a type of uh, tensor I imaging. It's really you're trying to emulate the or image as, as best as you can the, the tracks of the actual uh, neural connections in the brain. So this is, um, for some cases it might be useful, this is really not uh, bread and butter. It's, it's within the cap capabilities of MRI and different uh, signals and we do a lot of fancy stuff with MRI. Most of it um, it's really for very specific uses or research uses, but it, it's out there and it definitely has some uses and it has been reported uh, in the literature for many different things. Here we have some cases in which we perform MRI with contrast. Uh, they are the following. Number one, the postoperative spine is usually imaged with IV contrast. When you're suspecting tumors or cancerous involvement, when you're considering infection, it's also helpful to give contrast. And demyelinating disease also uh, can be an indication to perform uh, MRI with contrast, which uh, our agent is gadolinium. It is important to be aware that we shouldn't administer IV contrast or MRI uh, gadolinium uh, contrast in patients with a GFR of less than 30. The gadolinium is not considered to be nephrotoxic. However, in patients uh, with low GFR, because they cannot uh, excrete the contrast, then there's a risk for uh, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. And it has only been reported uh, in patients with uh, low GFR, specifically less than 30. Um, in addition, some of the problems that we can encounter with MRI, um, just like with any other imaging modality, we have problems with motion artifact. Uh, availability of MRI is uh, more limited when compared to CT. 
patients can have claustrophobia, and we do have some indications, which we're going to review in just a minute, and the presence or absence of, of hardware. Um, usually, the patient has hardware, even if it's uh, MRI safe, it's still uh, often a problem for imaging. Uh, the newer titanium-based hardware uh, allow for better imaging without affecting image quality. And the contraindication, like I, I mentioned, a pacemaker would be a contraindication or a type of uh, cardiac device. Uh, MRI uh, aneurysm clips or, or the compatible compatibility for uh, aneurysm clips is important. Uh, any metal devices in the brain or near the orbit is also important to assess before performing an MRI. And pregnancy is a relative contraindication. However, uh, we try to avoid it, and, and more importantly, we try to avoid gadolinium during pregnancy. Uh, we do, like I said, have some hardware artifact. Uh, we have different ways of minimizing it, but it's still uh, present there, just like with uh, other imaging modalities. And this is an example uh, of the type of artifact created by uh, hardware in the cervical spine. We can use uh, MRI, like I said, for image-guided procedures, just like we do with CTs. In this case, we have, on the left, we have fluoroscopy, and on the right, we have a CT image-guided procedures. And, and again, all of these procedures can be uh, often done with different modalities, depending on the operator and the expertise. Uh, some people might prefer ultrasound, others fluoroscopy, and CT, depending on what you're dealing with. For MRI, I think the, the most common MRI-guided procedure nowadays uh, would be breast biopsies. And, um, you know, that might, might, we might expand on that as we get better equipment and MRI-safe equipment. Another procedure I wanted to mention, and this is more related to the CT part, uh, or fluoroscopy part, I should say, is uh, kyphoplasty or vertebroplasties. And what we do here is we place a cannula through the pedicle in a patient, usually with an acute compression fracture. And once we confirm a good location, then we can go ahead and inject cement. The whole idea is to uh, minimize further compression and minimize uh, more patient discomfort or pain. So we, we have a structural um, benefit and we also have uh, a patient comfort benefit. This is a schematic of how we approach. You can see the approach is usually through the pedicle. You go into the virtual body. There are different devices. Some of them use a balloon. Here we're expanding, increasing the the height of the virtual body. Uh, other devices create a cavity, and then we, uh, in, within that cavity, we uh, add cement. So there are different permutations of this, but the general concept is the same. We're trying to uh, make that virtual body that has been compromised, we're trying to make it stronger and provide the patient with uh, some relief in, in pain from this uh, type of injury. Outpatient neck and back uh, pain symptoms or imaging related to for the assessment of, of these type of symptoms. So why you should know how should we you proceed for for the imaging or the evaluation of this etiologies. So a good example is first to know what you can uh, see or what you you can expect with different imaging modalities. For MRI and and you know, this disease is definitely the gold standard. Uh, we can see indirect signs in other modalities, but really MRI is the only modality where you can really assess the disc. In this case, we have a, a good example in the lower lumbar spine of uh, disc herniation. Uh, this on the left is a little bit higher up in the cervical spine. We also have a disc herniation, and you can see that can cause some narrowing of the spinal canal. And here is an axial view, also a focal area of this herniation and possibly 
uh, compressing on the nerve root here. So this is how the degenerative disease looks on uh, pathology. We have an example here of a, a very degenerated disc. We have essentially complete loss of the, the intervertebral disc space and we have both virtual bodies uh, here. We have the uh, hypertrophy of the ligaments and flavin, which I'll show you, and we'll show you how that can create entrapment of the nerve roots and narrowing of the spinal canal. This is a cervical spine, and um, in this case, you just have to see the anterior ossifies or some narrowing uh, of the intervertebral disc space here. Again, this is probably not as severe as a uh, pathology image you saw before. There are different uh, grades of, of degenerative disease, but the, the process is uh, really the same. It's just a matter of how severe it is going to be. Uh, this is an example I wanted to show you in which you have the canal, which is relatively normal. Uh, however, you still have a prominent uh, ligament and flavin here, it's even more prominent, I would say, or about the same, but you also have the disc bulge, and overall, then uh, this ends up creating a very narrow spinal canal. So again, in, in this image on the left, the canal is normal, but the patient still has some facet arthrosis and uh, other signs of degenerative disc disease or degenerative lumbar spine disease, I should say. And the main point is that um, you know, everyone's affected a little bit differently, um, and uh, lumbar spine imaging is not the the exception. You can have different grades of uh, changes from arthropathy, and even the pain might not necessarily correlate very well with the imaging. But the the point is that our, our one of our main concerns would be the assessment of the spinal canal. And on the left, you see a nice and open spinal canal with the nerve roots, and on the right, it's pretty narrowed and uh, kind of uh, stenose and, and therefore, that, therefore the patient might have symptoms from that. So reviewing uh, the imaging findings on, uh, on MRI of uh, the spine, what would you say is the most likely diagnosis in this case? Would it be congenital canal stenosis? Would it be degenerative disc disease? this herniation, metastasis, or fracture fragment. So when we look at this, uh, the first thing that catches our eye is definitely this uh, bulge here. And this would be consistent with a, a herniated disc, although you know the disc at, at this level doesn't, uh, doesn't look particularly desiccated, which is, is another term for a uh, decreased T2 signal. But it, I think that's the most likely case for, for this patient is definitely not congenital canal stenosis. Uh, degenerative disc disease, well, it could be a type of degenerative disc disease. However, you look at other levels and they're relatively preserved. So uh, for degenerative changes, you would like to see a more uh, diffuse process or multi-level process. So I would probably choose uh, number three on this one. For metastasis, we would like to have um, some changes in the bone marrow or some enhancing area. And uh, for a fracture fragment, we would expect to see um, other, other evidence of a fracture. So spinal infection, remember this is one of the uh, reasons for performing MRI with and without contrast. Uh, and we have the discitis osteomyelitis complex we usually look for fever, white count, and pain. Uh, in the absence of these signs, we cannot necessarily exclude that there's something going on. Uh, ESR is often helpful, but uh, you should be aware that uh, you need to perform an MRI of the lumbar spine with and without contrast. We have a nice example here. In this case, we're just uh, looking at the T2 weighted image, and you have increased edema you have some fluid and it involves two levels. Like we said before, uh, it nearly always involves the disc and the adjacent virtual body end plates. So here we have the disc and both end plates. This would be one end plate and this is the other end plate. 
both of them are involved. However, we would like to see some contrast to really uh, assess well this type of, of lesion. So here you have the pre-contrast T1. Notice you have no uh, visible uh, fluid in the spinal canal because the T1 is not a fluid sensitive image. You have a dark appearance here and you have a kind of like a bulge or a convexity here. And after you get contrast, you notice this is enhancing and this is a small epidural abscess and phlegmon in this case and you can see the changes involved with these two levels. This patient uh, is different from the one we saw on CT but the concept uh, remains the same. Once you give contrast you should be able to see some enhancement and better define what's going on uh, in this patient with osteomyelitis, discitis complex. Imaging for metastatic disease, and on the left you have an example of a uh, MRI, and specifically the type of MRI we have a T1 weighted sequence. You notice that we don't have any fluid. We have the normal fat, uh, fatty marrow, which is actually uh, not very, you know, only small portions of the spine have normal fatty fatty marrow, and that's really our clue that there's something going on. So we have all, all the dark spots in this spine on the left are abnormal, representing metastatic disease or metastatic implants. So you can see essentially the entire lumbar spine is involved, uh, particularly L5 there, which is completely uh, abnormal in terms of intensity, uh, signal intensity. Uh, on, the, on the right, you have the plain film uh, appearance of this. And uh, admittedly, this is not necessarily projecting very well, but you would expect to see some changes, either, uh, either expansile changes or sclerotic changes or, or lytic changes on the plain films as well. You can also do a bone scan for restaging. That would be uh, very helpful. And MRI is non-emergent, assuming we don't have any signs of, of uh, core compression from uh, metastatic involvement into the canal that, that results in compression of the spinal cord. Another image just showing what I just mentioned. Uh, when you have severe involvement of a level from, uh, from metastasis, you can have neurological symptoms. And in, in that case, the MRI would be considered a core compression MRI. When, uh, and, and in essence, it is an emergency because you would want to identify the level and then uh, refer this patient to neurosurgery in case he's a candidate for decompression. So a review question, try to identify the following pictures. We really discussed uh, all of them and you should pair them with their correct diagnosis. So uh, you can pause the video here and try to answer it yourself and I'll, I'll give you a couple seconds. So let's start with question A or image A. That one we saw there are multiple sides of abnormal signal on this T1 weighted MRI image and our diagnosis for this would be number three spine metastasis. For uh, image B we see increased edema involving two contiguous levels of the lumbar spine and we're definitely concerned about infection here although we don't have the pre and post uh, contrast images we're pretty suspicious because of the appearance of this lumbar spine so we'll go ahead and uh, put that one under spine infection and then we're left with uh, image C which would be degenerative disc disease and we can see some uh, this herniation or this bulge there well, that's it for this series on spine imaging. Thank you very much for your attention and don't forget to subscribe.